Hello everyone, it's Hoplite Mike, I hope you're all doing well. Today we are back with Lord of the Rings Total War Remastered, and we're doing a faction guide and overview for the Free Peoples. This is one of the more unique factions because the Fellowship of the Ring quest line is embedded within this faction. So you start with Frodo just outside of Hobbiton. Your first task is to get to Bree, where you'll meet with Aragorn. And from there, you'll head to Rivendell to meet with the rest of the Fellowship and begin your journey across Middle-earth and ultimately to Mordor, where you will destroy the Ring. However, you're not just a Horde, you are a faction in your own right. You have settlements, your own building chains and unit roster. So you've got a number of settlements in the west here. Got the two Hobbit settlements, Hobbiton, Mickle Delving. You have Bree. You have, you then have Fornos, which is quite prominent in the old realm of Arnor. There are some other settlements further east, and then two on the banks of the Andron. Beyond being the place where the dwarves step, stop over in the Hobbit films. At that point, it's Bjorn, the skin changer that lives there. At this point, it's Grimbjorn, his son but he also has a bear form. The Free Peoples are quite a weak faction. They are designed to be that way. They are an amalgamation of areas and cultures, none of them being particularly strong. Some of the old settlements are basically the remnants of Arnor, but by this point, they haven't really had any sort of military infrastructure in a while. And that's why you don't really have access to any stronger units or anything like that. However, there is a random spawn chance for Dunedain Rangers and also the Ents in Fangorn. So you do have a bit of power there. So I'll get started with this video then. I'll begin with the unique characters and generals. Then I'll move on to economy, recruitment, campaign strategy, and lastly, a showcase of the units on the battle map. I'm going to start with the unique characters and generals. As the Fellowship is part of this faction, you do have a lot of characters. So we can see three generals here, which are part of the main family tree. You've then got Bill Whitefoot, who is the only Hobbit general. And then we start with the Fellowship. So you've got Aragorn, Boromir, Frodo and Sam, Gandalf, Gimli, Grimbjorn, King of the Dead, Legolas, and that's us back to the original tree. So it's probably worth noting that the Fellowship of the Ring generals or characters like Frodo, Aragorn, uh, Legolas, Gimli and Boromir are all earmarked for that particular questline. So you need them at different points along the journey to trigger the scripts and allow you to get to the next part and the Fellowship questline ultimately allows you to destroy Mordor, but the other evil factions do remain. But uh, it's just worth mentioning because the the Fellowship Generals are earmarked for that questline. There's not really much else you can do with them. And actually on the harder difficulties, sometimes you need to support the Fellowship with your non-Fellowship Generals. So you won't have much left over to deal with the other factions. But I'll still run through them. So you've got Frodo and Sam here. They're basically a single entity unit. If you bring them into a battle, it will just be Frodo and Sam by themselves. They don't have any additional warriors, but they are a very weak unit. Frodo will actually last a bit longer because he has the ring, which does give you some buffs, but I wouldn't use them in combat unless I had no other choice. As you can see from their stats, they're basically a peasant unit. Uh, you got Aragorn up here, he's got the Rangers of the North, or Dunedain Rangers, but like with all the Fellowship Generals, they do have a very low unit size at 16. Most Generals Bodyguard units for other factions have about 60 to 80 for a unit. So this is the sort of limit on their power, but the stats themselves are very good. They are... The missile tag of 19 on the base unit is comparable to Elite Tier Elven units, and then it's got excellent defense and attack. So some of the strongest units in the game there. For the rest of the Fellowship, Legolas has the Markwood Rangers, which are, as you might expect, excellent arch units. 
Gimli has the old guards, which is the generic bodyguards for the dwarves, but this is a lower unit size, the 16. As they are for most of the fellowship, and then Boromir has the Thillian Rangers, which again, very good archers. But uh, yeah, they are basically, you need to use them for the quest line, so you can't really do whatever you want with them. Gandalf the Grey, as he starts at the start of the campaign, is a diplomat, so he can't fight until he becomes Gandalf the White, at which point he has the Grey Company cavalry units. You get him in Fangorn Forest, but they are a very strong general unit, but he, you do need him to go to Minas Tirith to fulfil the quest line, or one of the later quest lines, so um, he's kind of tied up, as it were. So the non-fellowship generals, you've got Roland, your faction leader, who has the bodyguards as his uh, bodyguard unit. That is the generic bodyguard for the free peoples. So every general that spawns in after the start of the campaign will have this bodyguard unit. And that's the model there. That's also the generic model for a free peoples general. It's a fairly weak unit, but this faction is designed to be weak, so um, the defense of 19 and attack on a 5 is probably on par with a, a mid-tier unit from a faction like Gondor, and then it doesn't have any plus hit points like most generals do. Uh, and lastly, the unit size is actually quite decent, 120. Well, this is the faction leader, so he will, he will have an inflated number, but the unit size on the base unit isn't bad, uh, just to give at least some strength to that unit. You've got Halbarad and Forlost, who is your, your only general that has the Dunedain Rangers as his bodyguards, a day unit size of 84 to begin with, but won't replenish above 64. So this is without a doubt your strongest general um, in terms of the unit stats and the unit size. So try to keep him if you can, because once you lose Halbarad, He'll essentially just be replaced with a generic general, which is the bodyguard unit, which is not very good. Um, you've then got, you have two other generals, so Asbar, sorry, Egbert, uh, also has the bodyguard unit, and I think there's another general. Kotsman has a different, you think he has the town marshals. Yeah, so again, this is other fairly this is actually a recruitable unit you can get these from the barracks but they take four turns to recruit and they're quite weak the melee attack of five isn't bad but the defense of 11 is is very low then you've got your one hobbit general in mickle dowling called will whitefoot he has the hobbit militia i think so actually a very strong arch unit uh not terrible in melee combat either these are better than the bodyguards and the town marshals, so uh, these are usable. But um, yeah, he actually does have a Hobbit model as well, which is quite nice. Nice looking model. Um, then you've got Hobbit, all the all the fellowship characters have their own models, so that's Frodo and Sam. There is Aragorn, and then Legolas, Gimli, and Boromir all look like they do in the films. Uh, then you have Gandalf the White, who obviously changes when he becomes Gandalf. Sorry, that's Gandalf the Grey. He obviously changes when he becomes Gandalf the White. So I think that's it for the generals. So next, I'll move on to the economy. In this section, I'm going to discuss how the economy works. Making money as the free peoples is not as easy as it is for certain other factions, primarily because you don't have the region building cards like Mordor or Angmar, for example, that give you tax income and population growth bonuses. Additionally, they are capped or soft capped at level three for most buildings because they can only build the third tier of the government building line. So even though they can build a tier 4 trader or farm, they would only be able to do that if they conquered a settlement that was already a large city or a huge city. If you have a settlement which is a minor city or below, 
You will never be able to upgrade that to a large city or a huge city and take advantage of the tier 4 buildings here. Just to run through the economy buildings, they do get access to the trader, 4 tiers of that, but soft capped at tier 3. You'll be able to build the trader in regions which have hidden resource, men, dwarves, elves, or hobbits. Almost all your surrounding regions will have one of those resources, so you shouldn't have any problems building that. You'll be able to go build that in most places. Just check what kind of income bonus you're getting before you build that. So if you click the income per turn button and then click on the trader, that will tell you what the increase is. This is giving us an additional 79 gold per turn, which is probably worth it given it's only costing 600 gold. But in certain regions you might only get plus 10 or plus 15, so just check that before you before you build. The next building line is the farms. So again, they get four tiers of that, but they have soft cap to level 3. I think it's only Gondor that gets the fifth tier. But your farming income is probably one of your most important revenue streams in the absence of any tax income bonuses. And fortunately, a lot of the regions in your... Well, a lot of the regions you start with, and then some of the ones that are surrounding you at the start will have hidden resource farms. So definitely build them where you can. I'd probably prioritize that over anything else just to get that population growth going as well, which will increase your taxes. Uh, you do get roads, but it's just the first tier, so you miss out on the trade income bonus from the second tier. Again, it's only a number of factions which gets tier 2. The other buildings, well, it's probably worth mentioning at this point, they don't get ports. So, that's unfortunate because they do start quite close to the coast, but um, free peoples can't build ports. And then lastly, we have the mines. So the three peoples do actually get access to three tiers of the mines. So if you want to build mines, you're looking for regions which have the mining resources, being the minerals and the ore, which is here. So if a region only has the blue mining resource, the minerals, then you'll only be able, you'll only be able to build tier one of the mines. If a region has the ore resource, then you can build all three tiers. So if you're pursuing a strategy where you're trying to capture settlements where you can build mines, to get your economy building, I would go for the ones which have ore over the ones which have the minerals. But overall, making money does get slightly challenging in the mid to late game as you build up your military. In terms of economic strategy, I would say a good thing to do is just to go for those settlements which have the mines. Part of your victory conditions are to destroy the orc rabbles, which are along the misty mountains here. A lot of these settlements do have some sort of mining resources, so these are good ones to go for. Especially Moria, because you get you essentially get Moria for free because one of the fellowship quest lines just means you need to put the fellowship right next to it and it'll kill the balrog and everything inside it and you get control of that region and because it has minerals or and mithril you get three revenue streams from a mine here so this is the probably the most lucrative settlement in the game uh, so definitely when the fellowship goes to this region i would follow up with a supporting army so you can hold moria because when the fellowship takes it and then leaves to go to warian uh, it's quite difficult to hold because the public order is not very good. But uh, yeah, I'd say go for these settlements. Something else which is important as well is the Eagles Eyrie. So you are one of the few regions or the few factions, the few good factions, which are close enough to take Eagles Eyrie fairly early on and that can also recruit great eagles. So in my campaigns, is what I do is just send my forces from Carrick and beyond straight up to Eagle's Eyrie to capture that because it does have tax incomes of about 4,000. So if you get this in the early game, then you should never really have any money troubles. And then as an, addition, as an additional bonus, it does give you the ability to recruit great eagles. Not every faction can do that, so it's a nice added bonus. 
So having said all that, I think we're now going to move on to the recruitment. In this section, I'm going to discuss how recruitment works. Recruiting as the Free Peoples is quite straightforward. Unlike most factions, they only have one core recruiting building, being the barracks. They don't have a forge or forge equivalent. They can also construct a stables in regions which have the lesser horses resource, like Bree does, but there's only one cavalry unit they get and it's very weak, so it's not usually something I go for. But as before, the units you can get from the barracks are not very strong, and that's just symbolic of the strength level of the faction as a whole. They are deliberately designed to be on the weaker end. However, there are some region-specific units you can recruit. So there are three Hobbit regions in the game, being Hobbiton, Mickle Delving, and Fenberg, on the other side of the Misty Mountains. In those regions, you can recruit Hobbit's units, of which there are two. So, firstly, you've got the Hobbit archers, which are actually very strong. They're actually nearly as strong as some of the Elven archers. The missile attack of 15 is just one below the entry-level Elven archer. And the range is middle of the road, I would say. Uh, but... In terms of how good archers are generally, these are just as good, if not better, uh, compared when you consider other top tier archers from different factions, non-elven factions. So the free peoples are not weak in the archer department. The hobbit archers are very good. It's just the unit size is a bit on the low side at 60. In terms of infantry, there's nothing you have which is really particularly strong. Actually, I forgot to go over the Hobbit Militia. The Hobbit Militia is the second Hobbit unit you can get, which is a hybrid melee and arch unit. It's slightly weaker than the Hobbit Archer, but it does it is more capable in melee combat, but it's just not that strong. But in terms of how good your melee infantry are overall, this is probably not much worse than your top tier units, so I'd still use them. So moving on to melee infantry, in Bree you can get the Bree Militia, which, you're pro which are probably your best infantry. They're definitely on the weaker end, but the melee attack of 4 and defense of 13 is about as good as it gets for this faction, so take advantage of them. Outside of the Bree Militia, the best unit is probably the Town Guards. Uh, they're quite similar to the Bree Militia, but they just have one less attack, I think. The top tier units, the Town Marshals, I wouldn't recommend getting them because they take four turns to recruit and their stats are worse than the Bree Militia. So to supplement the units from the barracks, there are some additional things to consider. There is a random spawn for Dunedain Rangers. They usually come in Fornost. So you'll get a notification when it happens, but sometimes Rangers of the North will appear in the settlement of Fornost and they are very strong units. Halbrad has a bodyguard of the Dunedain Rangers and you can see how much stronger than these these are than compared to your normal troops. These are probably one of the best units in the game. Then in Fangorn there is also a random Ent spawn, so there doesn't seem to be a notification for that, but just check Fangorn each turn because the Ents are very strong. They're comparable to trolls that the evil factions get, so they can do a lot of damage. So definitely bring them over if you can. And then being the Free Peoples, in Bjorn you start with Grimbjorn, who has the bear form as his uh, fighting form, so he's quite strong. And then sometimes Bjornings will spawn in Bjorn, which are also Berserker. So they're also quite strong. They are Berserker units. Uh, lastly, you're one of the only factions which can recruit Great Eagles from Eagles Eyrie. So if you capture the settlements, you'll be able to you'll be able to get access to those, which are quite strong, just quite uh, vulnerable to range fire. They also take eight turns to recruit, but uh, 
because your your regular trips are not that strong, so you do need to take advantage of the Rangers of the North, of the Ents, of the Peonings, and also of the Eagles. So try and take advantage of all the tools you have access to. But having covered that, I'm now going to move on to campaign strategy. In this section, I'm going to cover campaign strategy. It will be different to the other factions because of the Fellowship of the Ring questline. If we go to our victory objectives, we'll see we need to hold 15 provinces and destroy Mordor, Isengard and the Orc Rebels. So the Fellowship of the Ring quest essentially ends when we destroy the Ring in Mount Doom and that kills off Mordor as a faction. So the Fellowship of the Ring questline basically covers off one of your victory objectives but that still leaves the Orc Rebels and Isengard. The Orc Rebels are one of the factions where if you leave them to, run to their own devices, they will just conquer hundreds of regions and they will become a pain to deal with later on. The Noldor Elves don't usually expand much, so quite often you can just see the Orc Rebels take all of these rebel regions in this area and just completely surround the Noldor Elves and sometimes they also uh, spill out to this side and start taking these settlements. So I'd say you want to try and deal with them sooner rather than later. The problem is that you you have to commit all your Fellowship characters to the Fellowship of the Ring and on the high levels of difficulty you also need to commit other generals like non-Fellowship generals for example Roland and Bree because getting through Moria etc or sort of this area of the campaign is quite difficult if you don't have a supporting army behind the fellowship. So what usually happens or what I would recommend is the fellowship will go straight to Rivendell and then head to Moria. Uh, I would send a supporting army with them because the fellowship will automatically take Moria via one of the scripts um, and that is one of the Orc Rabble settlements. So leave your supporting army behind at Moria and just take this settlement. Usually if you don't bring a sporting army the fellowship will head off to Lorien and you'll probably lose Moria because the public order is not great but this is one of the most lucrative settlements in the game and it helps you defeat the Orc Rebels which is one of your victory conditions so try to hold this if you can. You will need a or somewhat of a supporting army when you get to the last mission of the Fellowship of the Ring um, just to deal with the Mordor reinforcements but it won't be many because you just need to set up some forts. I did do a playthrough of the Fellowship which goes through each of these scripts and how to get to the end of the quest line. Um, so I'd recommend just having a quick look at that if you want uh, some help with that sort of part of the campaign. So after you have sort of sent the Fellowship off to deal with Mordor and you've taken Moria, um, I'd say the next best, the next priority would be to deal with the rest of the Orc Rabel settlements. So in the economy section I did say that going up to Eagle's Eyrie straight away with your strips here would be a good idea, but alternatively if you're worried about the Orc Rabels you can actually just take all your trips from Bjorn and Clarik and go straight for Kidral Sin which is Goblin Town. There's a path just here, because once you've taken Moria and Kidral Sin, they don't really have much left. They've got Zach Kag, Zach Kala over here, and Turin. But if you can take those two settlements, those are their biggest settlements. So that's quite good to sort of cut them off there. Especially this path as well is quite important. It's one of the only paths across the Misty, Ma Misty Mountains in the whole map, uh, the other one being Moria. So it's quite a good settlement to take. So after you've dealt with the Orc Rabbles, that will just leave Isengard. Isengard don't usually expand too much. You'll probably need to deal with the Wild Men of Dunland before you deal with Isengard. But um, 
you will get ants in Fangorn Forest, so they do help against Isengard. And I'd also encourage you to bring up your ants around to Dunland if you're having trouble with them, because the Three Peoples are very weak as a faction. They're not even you know, even goblin units are potentially stronger than yours, so any extra help you can get is good to take advantage of, especially with the Ents, because they are as strong as troll units that the evil factions get. Very strong units. I did go through it in the recruiting section, but I would recommend recruiting the Hobbit Archers because they are very, very strong. Just as good as other factions, elite tier archers. And try and get Bree Militia from Bree. Uh, once you've got full armies of those, you should be able to deal with, you know, moderately, moderate strength armies. But yeah, I would probably say Isengard would be the last faction to deal with. But by that point, hopefully you've got a big Ent army ready to go. And also with the Fellowship, once you've done the quest line, you still have Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Gandalf the White as generals. And they are obviously incredibly strong, so you can bring them over to help. Especially, you get the Army of the Dead as part of the Fellowship of the Ring quest, so if you still have that unit, um, that's incredibly powerful. And you should be able to use those generals to take Isengard. That's about it for campaign strategy. The Dwarves of Erdlewine are quite, they expand quite fairly quickly. Usually they kind of come right across in the early turns, so they can help against good and bad if they start moving southwards. The Nordal Elves usually don't expand that far, but uh, they are to your west, so taking some of these regions over here is not a bad idea. But yeah, I think that's it for campaign strategy, so next I'll move on to the units themselves. In this section I'm going to do a full showcase of the units. The roster overall is quite weak. The faction is deliberately designed to be at the lower end strength-wise, because you defeat Mordor through the Fellowship of the Ring questline, rather than through the inherent power of your men. Having said that, there are some interesting units in here, being the Ents, the Awnings and the Dunedain Rangers. So my roster review will focus on those. The first four are all peasant units, so they do have very low stats, as you might expect. They all take three turns to recruit as well, so it's not something I usually go for. I try to get to the more powerful units like the Bree Militia and the Townsguard. However, the peasant bowmen are probably better than the peasant hunters as your early game range units because they have only slightly lower missile attack, but much more range and far more ammo. Then we have the Peasant Hunters, which are the early game skirmish units. As before, I would go for the Peasant Bowmen over these. Then we have the Peasant Woodsmen, which are your most basic melee infantry unit. The stats are very low, as you might expect, but the melee attack of 4 is actually not terrible and can still do a job in the early game. It's just the defense which leaves them very vulnerable to ranged fire. Then we have the Peasant Militia which are your most basic spear unit. I would usually go for the Woodsman over the Militia just because they have double the attack but if you do need a spear unit then this is the one you have access to in the early game. Then we have the Bree Militia which are your best recruitable melee infantry unit. You can only get these from Bree and from tier 2 of the barracks. The stats overall are not that high, but for the Free Peoples, this is probably the best they have. So, usually I rush the Tier 2 Barracks and Bree to be able to get these. They do actually have a very high unit size at 160. Most melee infantry units range from about 100 to 120, so that is a strength. Then we come on to the Towns Guard, which I would argue are your best melee infantry outside of Bree. They only have a slightly lower melee attack. They take a similar number of turns to recruit and have a similar cost and an identical unit size. So throughout your campaigns, usually it's the general's bodyguard you want to use as your mainline infantry because they are your strongest units. But in the absence of that, the town's guard will do as good a job as could be expected. 
Then we have the Town Marshals. They are slightly worse than the Bree Militia in that they have lower defense, but similar attack. Their unit size is also reduced to 120, and they do take four turns to recruit. So it's not a unit I usually go for, but they do have the Eagle mechanic. Then we have the Hobbit Archers, which are actually some of the best units in the game when you exclude the Elven units, but a missile attack of 15 is there or thereabouts when it comes to elite tier arch units. The range of 140 is a bit on the lower end, but not terrible, and then they do have very low defense and melee attack, but the arch performance is, is very good, and certainly from an archer perspective, the free peoples are not at a disadvantage when you compare them to most factions. Then we have the Hobbit Militia, which are hybrid melee and arch units. They're slightly weaker than the Hobbit Archers in terms of their Archer performance because they have one less missile attack and slightly less ammo. However, with the defense of 14 and melee attack of 3, in melee combat they will perform about as well as some of the other infantry units you have, like the Free Militia and the Towns Guard. Just bear in mind the unit size of 60 is very low. Then we have the Peasant Horsemen, which are the only cavalry unit that the Free Peoples get access to. You can get these from the stables in a region which has lesser horses. As cavalry go, this is about as bad as it gets. The defense, melee attack, charge, they're all very low, but unit size is actually not bad. 80 is about as high as it gets for cavalry. It's not something I usually go for just because they take four turns to recruit, but it can be useful to, to just have one unit of cavalry to chase down enemy units in battles, but they will rout very quickly. Then we have the Rangers of the North, or the Dunedain Rangers. These are not units you can recruit as the Free Peoples, but they do appear randomly. There is a spawn chance for them to appear in Fornost. So you definitely want to take advantage of these if, they, if you are lucky enough to get them. Their stats are extremely high. The missile attack of 19 and range of 170 is on par with elite tier archer, sorry, elven archers. And then the defense of 24 and melee attack of 8 is also similar to elite tier melee infantry units. So these are an excellent unit. The unit size of 60 is quite low, but that I guess that's the balance to their power. But definitely take advantage of these if you can get them. Then we have the Ents. Like with the Rangers of the North, you can't recruit these units. They appear randomly in Fangorn Forests. However, the chance to spawn does seem to be a lot higher than with the Dunedain Rangers. I usually see a lot more Ents than I do of the Rangers of the North. They perform similarly to the Trolls of the Evil Factions in terms of their stats and the plus hit points. So these are some of the strongest units you can get in your campaigns and definitely ones you want to take advantage of if you get them. Then we have the Bjornings. Like with the previous two units, you can't recruit these, but they do appear randomly in the settlement of Bjorn. These are Berserker units, so they have naturally high attack and morale, but very low defense, making them vulnerable to missile fire, and they can go Berserk. So. Pretty strong units, but just bear in mind the vulnerability to archers. Then we have the bodyguards, which are the generic general's bodyguard unit for the free peoples. Stats wise, they're probably on par with a mid tier unit from a faction like Gondor. So as bodyguard units go, they're not strong, but these are the best you have access to. So if you, if you're going through your campaign, a good path to take would just be to stack your generals all into one army because that's the strongest army you're going to be able to make. Then we have the transformed Bjorning. Grim Bjorn, who is Bjorn's son and also starts in the settlement of Bjorn. His battle form is this bear unit here. So it's a very powerful unit. The melee attack of 30 is virtually unmatched, I think. And then it's got good defense and plus hit points. Like with all single entity units, they are quite vulnerable to range fire, but offensively, 
this is one of the strongest units in the game. So definitely something you want to take advantage of if you're playing as the Free Peoples. That's going to be it for this one. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you on the next one.